Okay, so welcome to your pre-lecture video for lecture two. So for this video, I'll be teaching you all of the basic terminology for lecture two. So please rewatch it as many times as you need to until you know how to use these terms well. Um, also, I'll be using a kind of cookbook-based analogy to help you understand the relationships between these structures. But just to warn you, please don't use this analogy during your quizzes and exams because if on the exams you start talking about cookbook number two, uh, the marker's not going to know what the heck you're talking about. All right, so let's start with the smallest things when we're talking about genetic information. All right, so genetic information is encoded by DNA molecules. And the smallest piece of DNA you can have is a single DNA nucleotide. So nucleotide consists of a phosphate group, a deoxyribose sugar, and a nitrogenous base, okay, which basically just means a basic molecule containing these nitrogen atoms as well. Now there are four different DNA molecules that actually have kind of the same structure down here when it comes to the phosphate and the oxyribose sugar. It's exactly the same for all four. The only difference between them are the bases. All right? So you have two purines, which are adenine and guanine, and two pyrimidines, which are thymine and cytosine. All right? So we abbreviate those as A, G, T, and C. All right? So what this means is that in the DNA language, this alphabet basically only has four different letters. It only has A, T, G, and C. All right? So everything that we write is going to be spelled out in these four letters. So, with these single DNA nucleotides, we can actually form strong bonds in between them. Okay, so uh, with the right enzymes, we can join this sugar part of uh, this nucleotide here to the phosphate part of this nucleotide down here, right? And then we can form a phosphodiester linkage that joins these two bonds together. So this is a covalent bond that's quite strong, all right? So using these bonds, we can actually string together a whole bunch of these nucleotides, okay, to make a single-stranded DNA molecule. So this single-stranded DNA molecule has a backbone made up of sugars and phosphates bonded together. So phosphate to sugar to phosphate to sugar to phosphate to sugar basically makes one long chain, and that's what holds the nucleotides together. But there's also a series of bases that stick out the side of this chain, all right, um, in a very specific order that they were kind of bonded together in. And this, this, uh, it is this series of letters, okay, the specific order of these letters that encodes our genetic information. So pretty much just like the letters in a page, the order that they come in tells us different information. The order that these bases come in on a DNA chain also tells us information as well. So, so far what we've made is a long single-stranded DNA molecule that has bases that encode genetic information sticking out on one side. All right, But these bases can actually form bonds as well. So using a weaker type of bond called hydrogen bonds, um, we can actually join this base with another base by the um, by the bases between the bases. Okay. Now these hydrogen bonds are very specific, and they only allow for the bases uh, cytosine and guanine to join together. All right, and they join together with three specific hydrogen bonds okay, in specific locations, so they can't bind with T or with A. Right. So that means that since there is a cytosine here, we're going to have to have a guanine bond with it using three hydrogen bonds again. Right. And if we have the right enzymes around, we can also start forming a sugar phosphate backbone here. All right, the next letter here is a T, and so that can only bond with an A with these two specific hydrogen bonds. Okay, and it's this hydrogen bonding arrangement that makes it so that only A and T can join together. So with A down here, the letter that must join with it is also T. All right, so notice that we've now made a second strand of DNA in a, in a very rough way. We'll talk about the specifics of this next week. Um, but notice that the second strand of DNA also has its very own sugar phosphate backbone. It also has its own bases as well. And that these bases perfectly complement the strand across from it, okay, with the original strand. So every C is joined with a G, every A is joined with a T. All right? And between these two strands, it's these uh, hydrogen bonds that hold the two strands together. Okay? And we call these complementary base pairs because they have the right um, base on it to form the right number of hydrogen bonds, all right? Now, please remember that complementary doesn't mean the same, okay? So this strand is not at all the same as this strand here. Okay, complementary just means that their bases are bonded properly between C and G and A and T, okay? So it's joining the other base that it can bond with. It's not the same strand, all right? But in this way, we basically made a double-stranded DNA molecule. Now, in reality, this double-stranded DNA molecule doesn't lie flat like this. We just draw it like this so it's easier to see. It actually twists itself into a double helix shape, which we can draw in many different ways. Um, for example, this is a space-filling model showing kind of a, a single ball, colored ball for each of the atoms, right? 
Sometimes we also just abbreviate the sugar phosphate backbone into this blue ribbon here, okay, just to make it easier to see what's happening with the paces. Or if we're drawing it really small, sometimes we just draw the two little ribbons and, and that's about it. All right. So let's look at a larger scale now. So in the nucleus of our cells, each of our DNA double helix, uh, helices are actually wrapped around these proteins called histone proteins. Okay, so you see our DNA double helix. It's first wrapped around these histone proteins, right, just to kind of package them up in a smaller package. But once we've made this string of beads, we can also take that string of beads and wind it together again to make an even more dense and thick kind of uh, cord. And we do this again and again to make um, it very, very condensed. So one DNA double helix plus all of the proteins that it's attached to equals one chromosome. Okay, so this is what chromosomes look like inside the cell once you stain them with fluorescent dye. Okay, so a nucleus of a human cell like ours actually contains 46 chromosomes, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But for now, I just want to focus in on a single chromosome. Right? So this kind of schematic drawing of a chromosome here, it actually contains one very long DNA double helix, which we kind of show strung out over here. All right? Now, at very specific, uh, many of these specific locations or loci on the DNA molecule, you'll actually find a bunch of different genes. Okay? Now, a gene is basically a region of DNA, like this region, green region here, that encodes information. And this information is used to make a specific protein most of the time, or sometimes also just a functional RNA as well. All right. Now, one chromosome, so the DNA of one chromosome, can actually contain many, many genes. All right. For example, this gene here might code for lactase, which is the protein that you need to uh, digest milk. Uh, this other gene over here might encode melanin, which is needed to make, for example, your hair darker colored. Um, and this gene here might encode for some protein that makes you produce more testosterone, which you might need if you want to look like that. <laughs> um, now, to help you kind of keep track of how all these different terms interact, all right, one way you can think of it is you can think of a chromosome as being kind of like a cookbook, all right, and a gene as being like a recipe. And this kind of makes sense because every cookbook contains hundreds, many, many different recipes, not thousands of recipes, right? Just like every chromosome contains thousands of genes, all right? And every recipe has information for making a specific food, just like every gene has information for making a specific protein, all right? So this analogy is going to come in handy when we get to more complicated levels, which we're <coughs> working towards now. <coughs> Excuse me. So, in an unfertilized cell, we're going to look at a bigger scale now. So look at an entire cell and the, and the DNA found in that. So we're going to start with a simpler cell, which is an unfertilized human egg cell. All right, so in an unfertilized human egg cell, there are only 23 chromosomes, right? But all of those are different, all right? So each of these 23 chromosomes actually contains a different set of genes, right? For example, for uh, chromosome number two here, that's where you'll find um, the lactase gene. Right? But also on chromosome 15, you might find the gene that encodes your blue or brown eye color. Uh, on chromosome 19, you might find the gene for determining whether your blood is type A, type B, or type AB, or type O. All right, so since there's different genes found on each of these 23 chromosomes, you need all 23 of them in order to make one complete genome. Okay, so a genome is basically a complete set of genes that, in this case, is necessary to, to make a human being. So you need all 23 chromosomes to get all the genes you need. All right? So to put it another way, you can think of a cookbook series with five different books as kind of like being a genome that has 23 different chromosomes. Okay? Because if you take out any one of these cookbooks, it contains hundreds of unique recipes, just like every chromosome contains hundreds or thousands of different genes. Okay? So one recipe found in this cookbook um, is kind of like one gene found in this genome over here, okay? So because these genes, for example, in the cookbooks, um, cookbook five has the recipe for, you know, chocolate chip cookies, cookbook four contains the recipe for hamburgers, two for beef wellington, whatever. Um, kind of similar to the genome over here where each chromosome has a bunch of important recipes, important genes on it, okay? So you need all five cookbooks in order to make a complete cookbook series that contains every recipe that you might want to make. Just like you need all 23 chromosomes to make a full genome that contains all the genes you need for making a, a viable human being. All right? So what happens when we take that egg and actually fertilize it? All right? 
So this egg here has one whole genome, which consists of 23 chromosomes that came from mom. Okay, but this sperm also adds an entirely new genome, okay, one whole genome again, with another 23 chromosomes that came from dad. And so this fertilized egg, which we also call a zygote, will actually have two complete genomes, okay? So two sets of 23. So the zygote and the baby that it grows into will be 2n equals 46. Now I know a lot of people get confused by this notation, but it's actually really simple. So the number that comes before the n basically tells us how many genomes we have, all right? So this zygote has two sets of chromosomes, so we have 2n. The number after the equal sign just tells us the total number of chromosomes. Okay, so since this genome has 23 and this genome has 23, then our total number of chromosomes must be 46. Okay, simple as that. A little bit more terminology. So um, we, have, we call cells that have one whole genome, uh, haploid, and we call cells that have two genomes, diploid. Okay, and we do this for diploid organisms, such as ourselves. Okay, so in diploid organisms like ourselves, the only haploid genes we find are the gametes, or so the only haploid cells we find are the gametes. So gametes are our sperm and our eggs. Okay, um, our somatic cells, which is pretty much most of the other cells in our body, are all diploid. Okay, so if you pick any you know skin cell or muscle cell in your body, they'll have two whole genomes and be a diploid cell. But if you take any of your sperm or eggs, they would be haploid and have only 23 chromosomes, only one set. Okay. Now, diploid cells such as your skin cells have two copies of your entire genome, okay? So you have a maternal genome that you got from your mom and a paternal genome that you got from your dad, okay? That also means that you have two copies of every chromosome as well. So for example, you have two copies of chromosome two, okay? Now, both copies of your chromosome two have the same sets of genes. For example, chromosome two might have the gene for melanin for hair color and lactase for digesting milk. Okay. Not only that, those genes are actually found on the exact same locations, the same loci of these chromosomes. Okay, so looking at chromosome 2 and chromosome 2, you'll find the melanin gene near the, the top of this chromosome, whereas the lactase gene is always near the bottom. That's for this chromosome and for this chromosome here. So when you have chromosomes that have the exact same genes and the exact same loci, okay, we call these homologous chromosomes. Okay? Uh, other ways to say it is you can say that these two chromosomes are parts of a homologous pair, or you can say that this is a pair of homologs, okay, so this is one homolog and another homolog of a homologous pair, all right? So going back to our cookbook analogy here, okay, so each of these genomes came from different parents, so let's say that for my daughter Katie, she got a full set of cookbooks from mom and a full set of cookbooks from dad for me, okay, and um, that means that she also has two copies of every cookbook. So she has two copies of cookbook number two. Okay? And if you look inside each of these cookbooks, you'll find the exact same gene. So you'll find a gene for chocolate chip cookies. You'll find a gene for bacon hamburgers. Right? And not only will they have the same genes, those same genes will be on the same page number, the same locations of each of these cookbooks. That's why we'll call these homologous cookbooks. Okay? So <clears throat> the cool thing is these two genomes are not exactly the same. Right? So for example, uh, mom's copy of the cookbook has a recipe for cookies and burgers and so does mine, right? But my version of the recipe might call for white chocolate chips, right? And my burger recipe might have been misprinted so it's completely illegible, all right? So going back to uh, the genome version, so let's say this is actually my, my daughter's uh, chromosomes here, right? <clears throat> She got two copies of the hair color gene and the milk digesting gene, right? One from mom and one from dad. So mom's version might call code for dark hair and for a working lactase gene. But maybe my homolog, for some strange reason, encodes you know, blonde hair color. Okay, so both hair color genes, they both make the, the protein that goes into the hair, but mine's, my version's a little different. It makes yellow pigment instead of dark. Okay. Um, also, maybe my lactase gene is mutated, so it doesn't actually make any working enzyme, which is well, why I'm lactose intolerant, actually. All right. So every chromosome has the same genes, hair color, lactase, right? But they might be different versions on different chromosomes, because they came from different people. This came from mom, this came from dad. Okay. So just to cover a bit more terminology then, so looking at our cookbooks, right? So for the cookie recipes, that are found on the cookbook number two, right? My version of the recipe makes white chocolate chip cookies, and my wife's version of the recipe makes milk chocolate chip cookies, okay? 
um, using, so applying that to proper terminology then. So for the hair color gene, right, which is kind of generally describing this, the, the gene found at this location, um, it's found on chromosome two. The paternal allele makes blonde hair pigment, meaning the paternal version of this gene makes the blonde hair pigment. And the maternal allele, meaning the maternal version of this gene is slightly different and it makes black hair pigment. Okay, so allele means a particular version of the gene. Gene refers to this, to this location, the chromosome that makes a protein for the hair. Okay, so that's about it for now. So I just went through about 30 terms uh, in about 15 minutes and uh, we'll be using these terms all throughout the semester. Um, now to keep this video as short as I can, I'm not going to bother reviewing them a second time in the same video because you can pretty much just watch it again. So I really highly recommend that you watch it at least one more time uh, or more, many more times than that uh, until you know all the terms very well. Alright, thanks for watching. I will see you in class. Later.